Maybe you want to point a telescope directly at the sun. Or maybe not, but stick around and that's exactly what we're going to do. Hello space lovers, Jason from the Vast Reaches here. With at least two high-profile eclipses coming in the North America region over the next six months, it's a hot topic right now. It would be no exaggeration to say many thousands of cameras are going to be pointed directly at the sun. Because of this, I think the audience for this video might be a little more general. So we're going to start with a few basics. I'm a longtime solar photographer. I've got experience with pointing optics at the sun safely. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that there are certain dangers associated with doing this. Um, temperatures at the focal point of the telescope can reach hundreds of degrees within seconds. It can melt, burn, and otherwise let the smoke out of anything you put in the path. Uh, Post-eclipse season is littered with photographs and stories of people who didn't heed these warnings and melted their own equipment, um, sensors and shutters, or returned rental equipment with the same damage done to them. So I'm hoping that uh, a little bit of this talk can help prepare you properly for what's to come. This may come as a little bit of a surprise, but I don't consider myself an idiot normally. But everybody makes mistakes, has momentary lapses in judgment, and I'm no exception. One day I was outside imaging the sun. I had my telescope pointed directly at it. I decided I wanted to swap out the optical elements in the back of the telescope for the, uh, the camera components. So I capped the scope, I took the camera and filter off the back of the telescope and I put a plastic cover in its place. Went inside, did some work on that, came back outside to uh, replace the, the uh, camera. And what I did next, I don't have any explanation for, but I uncapped the front of the scope before taking the plastic cap off the back. And within seconds I was smelling smoke and I'm like, what, what is going on here? didn't even realize, but I uh, looked down and I saw this plastic cap smoking. This is the uh, cap I had. It's got a nice melted impression of the sun in the back of it. And right on top of the graphic that tells you not to point this telescope at the sun, melted, uh, melted a hole in it, melted the paper. So that's what I was smelling. But just serves as a little bit of a cautionary tale that even with experience, you can make these mistakes. And it's no joke. It will damage equipment very quickly. If any organic material was behind it, to say your skin or your eye, you don't want it looking like that. Enough said. All right, so enough about the dangers. How can you do it safely? Well, there's a number of ways to do that, but the main idea here is you need to filter the light. You need to reduce the energy of the sunlight so that when it passes into focus, and onto the plane of your camera sensor, it doesn't carry the full intensity of the sun like gathered by your aperture. So there are two main types of solar filters in use today uh, by astronomers and photographers, and, and those are a white light filter, which just serves to dim the image down through various means, and a narrow band filter, which is a more specialized type of filter which works on interference principles and looks at just a narrow sliver of the spectrum and allows that to pass to the camera. Today we're going to talk about white light or broadband filters. So I have with me two examples of white light filters that can be used at the front of the telescope. Uh, these come in several different flavors, but generally there's two types. One of those is neutral density, and the other one is solar film. Now these can both be purchased uh, from an astronomy re retailer or a photography shop. Um, generally, solar film is accepted as the more safe solution because this is designed and sold to reduce the incoming light enough to, for safe observation through a telescope and photography. Now a neutral density filter, you have to be absolutely sure that you buy this in an in a opaqueness that is satisfactory to reduce the energy enough for safe observation. All right, so all this so far has been building to the point of this video, which is to do a review on the other type of white light solar filter, which is a solar wedge, a Herschel wedge as it's called. 
Herschel wedges have a prism in the back and it rejects most of the heat out of the back of the telescope. So all the incoming light passing straight out the back, except for the tiniest fraction, which is being reflected up into the eyepiece or the camera, which you attach here. So we're going to take a look at this and we're going to start off here with a quick unboxing video so you can see everything that comes along with this. This is the Botter Herschel Prism Mark II. And this is a white light system, so we'll be observing the sun in white light with this. Um, this comes in two versions. There's a visual and a photographic version. The visual comes with this solar continuum filter, which is a 7.5 nanometer filter centered uh, in the green range of the spectrum. The reason that this is used is because it will provide a sharper image. Uh, looking at green usually is where your telescopes are best corrected or the optics perform the best. So uh, that trims the light down into that spectrum. And then we've got um, a neutral density filter. This is a ND 3.0, which will dim the light significantly beyond that and allow us to observe it visually. The Herschel prism works by passing the incoming light from the front of the telescope into a prism, which the majority of it is dumped out to a ceramic plate in the back, which is, then dissipates the energy and the remaining percentage, which I think is just a few percent for um, something on that order, goes up into the eyepiece or into the, the camera system. Now this is the photographic version, which means it comes with four different selections of neutral density filters. So you can kind of tailor the brightness of the image to the, to, to the camera, um, allowing you to get, uh, say, shorter exposures. If you want it, you could use a um, less opaque neutral density filter, essentially something that dims the image a little bit less. So look at this kit a little bit. I'm gonna swing it around here. It shows what comes in this box. We've got an ABS hard case, nice to hold all the components as well as the filters. The uh, visual system, like I said, comes with this solar continuum filter and then a, a dark or the strongest neutral density filter. And then the photographic version comes with these three additional filters, uh, which we'll look at here. Um, something I didn't expect to see and also is apparent tape to the box is uh, Potter has supplied a filter removal tool for this kit and this will just help um, because these filters screw in internally I think they are recessed to some extent so this tool should help remove it but this is just included with the kit as shipped and like I said this uh, denotes here that this is the photographic version that we're looking at and on this side um, just shows some of the main features. This actually has a, um, I'll call it a swing knob, but it's, it's an adjustment here where you can actually rotate the components. If you were to use a polarizing filter, because there's polarized light uh, reflecting off the diagonal, you can adjust the brightness that way. That's not something I'm gonna do here because that's more of a, a visual feature where you can adjust the brightness to your liking uh, visually. But because I'm gonna be taking photographs, I'll just find a neutral density filter that works and use it that way. Let's crack into it. So there's a little uh, inspection sticker on the back and then this, this box just flips open here. So we've got the instruction manual and really nice ABS hard case. Set this up, remove the box, and we can take a peek inside. All right, it's nicely labeled. It's got an owner sticker. It's got the pressurization valve, like a Pelican type style case. Open it up, and here we have it. So we've got the filters, as I said, a little, little tool for uh, removing components. Um, we've got the 3.0 neutral density filter. Oh, sorry, I'm not used to these cases. They slide lock together. And the solar continuum filter here. Got it now. 
And then we have the additional neutral density filters. So this will be the 0.6, the 0.9, back, looks like we've got the 1.8. So once I get this set up on the telescope, we'll dial that in. Now let's have a look at the prism itself. So this is the virtual prism. Really beefy unit. This exterior is all, well, it appears to be die cast metal. And you've got your ceramic plate in the back for heat dissipation. Peek inside. From the top, uh, looking down into it, it appears black, and that's because it's uh, not passing very much light. If you look at it from the front, you can see the perforated plate, which is part of the heat rejection system. And you really can't see up into the top, and I think that that's uh, mainly just because it's. it's dimming the image down so much. So you can see here it's got the slider for adjusting the rotation of the filter pack. And then you get the quick lock to lock things in. So I'll demonstrate that real quick with this. So securely locks it in. We'll button it up and the uh, next time you see this thing we'll be on a telescope. Really nice um, solid quality looking part so far. I just wanted to show since I took this apart. So here we have um, removing these set screws here. You can remove the filter pack and the click lock adapter. All right, so a little detail on the setup. This is the Botter solar wedge behind a six inch AR-152 telescope by Explore Scientific. Doing a time lapse right now. You can see here the uh, solar image on the back of the ceramic plate aimed right at the sun. Disregard my aluminum foil sun sh shield. That's just blocking the light from hitting the front face of the camera. Try to keep the camera a little bit cooler. All right, so I kept it like this, tracking the sun for about an hour and a half. I was capturing images every five seconds um, after I completed the, uh, the previous one. So I ended up with uh, over 500 individual frames. So here you see the live view of the camera as I was capturing. Uh, one thing that jumps out at me initially is the conditions aren't great. Uh, the, the image of the sun is uh, jumpy and uh, moving around quite a bit and that's just due to the atmospheric stability at the time. So we have to temper our expectations a little bit. That's going to lead to uh, somewhat more blurry results and that's really going to be the limiting factor in this this shot here or uh, the sequence of images but uh, we'll have a look at the final video anyway. All right, so here we see the photosphere of the sun. You can see the undulating granules of the, the uh, convection cells, and you can see all the details within the sunspots and the infall of material. This video is played back forward and reverse in a boomerang style, so the uh, eye can track the motion. But in general, I'm, I'm super satisfied with the results here, and I uh, was just hoping to capture some of the granulation in the photosphere and uh, that's exactly what we're seeing here and as we zoom back out uh, we are looking at active region 3379 this was captured on the 24th of july 2023 so zooming way in we are well beyond the resolving capabilities of the scope and what the conditions could deliver but i thought this offered a, a cool view of the infall of material you can see the plasma falling down into the sunspot also, this is the uh, relative size of the Earth to scale, so you can see just how big these structures actually are. Okay, so this was the setup I used in the first outing. You can see I've got the ASI 174 mm camera with a Teleview PowerMate in between the camera and the diagonal, and that just serves to uh, amplify the image, uh, give a more zoomed-in result. 
I wanted to see for the second outing if I could get a full disc shot. So what I did is remove the power mate that you see here from the original setup so that the, uh, the camera was mounted all the way into the diagonal to get myself uh, more field of view. And here's the result. So this is a look at the full disc of the sun captured as a two panel mosaic using the ASI 174 and the native focal length of the scope. I was pretty happy with this result and it's interesting also as the uh, as you approach the limb of the sun you can begin to see the brighter patches of the active regions become more prominent. As you may know I really enjoy processing images so for this one I really went after small scale contrast to pull out the differences in these regions and, and accentuate them. That said the ASI 174 is not a high resolution camera so once you zoom in you start to lose the ability to see the details. So I went back with the ASI 183, which has smaller pixels and higher resolution and imaged it uh, in higher detail with the 5X PowerMate again installed. So here's a picture of that setup. I use this same configuration for planetary imaging, which is why it includes a filter wheel. I didn't remove it here. I just shot through the clear luminance filter. I was once again struggling with the atmospheric conditions, but I think I got some pretty decent results here. So here's a close-up of the sunspot in active region 3394, taken on August 8th of 2023. And then I applied some additional sharpening algorithms to try to bring out uh, some more clarity in the photosphere itself and in the granulation of the convection cells. As a close-up, I just thought this looked awesome. Kind of a popcorn appearance. Reminds me of the images from the Daniel K. Inoue telescope, which is uh, currently producing some astounding images of the photosphere at this scale. Again, I push the contrast very hard to uh, arrive at these results. And I'm always challenging myself to come up with unique sharpening techniques uh, depending on the application. On the 29th of August, I came back and did another close-up uh, sunspot shot of active region 3413. Uh, again, conditions were not the best, but I uh, was able to uh, use that same system to produce this image. And as you watch this as a time-lapse sequence, you can kind of see the uh, conditions uh, come in and out as the scene changes throughout the afternoon. Unfortunately, it really does limit what you can produce on a system like this. Now again, we're looking at the motion as a boomerang style video, so it plays forward and then reverse. This capture was over the span of about 30 minutes, so there's really not too much large scale movement visible. Now here's a raw shot with only deconvolution applied. And then here is the final image, which is fully processed. It's important to point out here that I'm capturing images with a monochrome camera, so the output is in black and white, and it's colorized afterward to a pleasing tone, but I'm actually shooting through a green filter, so naturally these shots are green, but looking at a green sun is, is fairly odd. So I prefer to tone it the uh, familiar yellow-orange hue. And then here is a close-up look at the limb of the sun with some slightly different processing applied. Okay, so that was a look at some of the pictures I was able to obtain using this solar wedge. In the spirit of making this a review, I wanted to go over some of the impressions I had while using it, and we'll do that with the pros and cons list. So on the positive side, there's no doubt that the build quality and the image quality that I'm getting out of this filter is quite excellent. There's also a lot of uh, flexible filtration options, meaning you can use the neutral density filters that are supplied and also the solar continuum filter for increased sharpness and in capture. Another option is a calcium filter, which uh, Botter also makes, as well as perhaps some other creative solutions. Another benefit is it works generally on a wide variety of refractors, pretty much anything that does not have rear optical elements. And when used properly, it's accepted as a safe solution for observing the sun directly. On the negative side, it is quite expensive in comparison to its closest competitor, which I would consider solar film. The internal filter pack, though it offers some flexibility and filtration options, it 
requires the disassembly of the unit um, by taking out four set screws. It's not the easiest thing to get to and swapping it out would take some time. My immediate thought here is this would not be the best option for a total solar eclipse where you want to remove your solar filter during totality. It would be entirely too cumbersome and the last thing you want to be doing during that time period is messing with your telescope. It is a white light filter and it does not show details on the chromosphere. Now this isn't a knock against this filter specifically, but for the price you're starting to get into the territory where many people would consider a narrow band filter option just to have access to the uh, chromospheric details. I also didn't find that it was necessary for me to explore the different neutral density options that were supplied with the photographic version. I would have been just fine with the visual version, the uh, ND 3.0 and the solar continuum filter. And lastly, it cannot be used on all telescopes, such as Newtonians or SCTs. That's a pretty major drawback. So what's my overall impression? Well, I really enjoyed using the Botter Herschel Solar Prism. But if you stuck with me and looked at my results, you can see that the limiting factor there generally is my atmospheric conditions. So while I think this unit would produce great detail, it's going to take some special days and some special sessions in order to make that a reality. But those times do exist and I'm looking forward to the opportunity of using this filter during one of them. I really can't wait to see what's possible. All right, if you're anything like me, you might be asking yourself, which one's better? The Herschel wedge or the front aperture solar film? Well, unfortunately, in the scope of this video, I didn't get a chance to try that out. But hopefully I will in the future. So if you're interested, drop me a line in the comments and let me know. All right, so that wraps up our look at the Bonner Herschel Solar Prism, Mark II. The astronomy vendor, Agena Astro, sent this over for evaluation, but the opinions are all my own. They had no say in the content of this video. I will say at the end of the loaner period, they offered me the opportunity to purchase this, which I did because I enjoyed it that much. I really enjoy making these videos. It's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of work. Um, so consider hitting like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. I'm gonna to try to start building this channel by making more of these videos and any support you can provide really, really helps me in that endeavor. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers and clear skies.